there. Okay, right, super. Um, anyway, it's nice to see you all, even though it's uh, obviously um, a Zoom meeting. And, and the last time I think I, I talked to you was was live in the, in the in those pre-COVID days. <laughs> um, so um, just to give you a brief, um, and obviously um, some of you know about me before I've heard my talks possibly. Um, uh, I'm a I'm a research osteopath, which is um, when I first started in 34 years ago. Was uh, I was the only clinical research osteopath. I thought in the country, but since I've been lecturing around the world, I've realised I was the first in the world, <laughs> literally, first uh, osteopath to be involved in clinical research as well as running a clinic. And my field was has always been ME. So I started in uh, 1989 with my first ME patient. Um, and um, this was uh, um, in the days of yuppie flu. Some of you will remember it well. And um, it was always, um, you know, uh, taught to us. If somebody comes in with yuppie flu, you know, tender loving care, smile at the patient. And there's not much else we can do as osteopaths for, for these conditions. Um, so I treated this uh, cyclist who was uh, as um, uh, for his back problems he came in for. But he was also told me it was in those days I was very much involved in sport medicine. And um, as an osteopath, I was uh, I was treating quite a few top sportsmen. And one of the group I used to treat were the Rally Banana team, which was the, the leading cycling team in the UK before Sky. They were the precursors to Sky team. And uh, one of their members had ME. And he had, had, hadn't been cycling for seven years, and he came to me with with back problems, and he said they had ME as well. And I said, well, I can treat your back and can get your posture working better as an osteopath, which I did. And as I was treating his posture and getting his upper sp spine working better, his ME symptoms started to clear up, started to clear up. And after a few months, he was completely symptom free. And he told me that you've, you know, he's been everywhere in the world trying to get better and my treatment has got him better. So I thought, well, what have I done? And I started thinking about the spine, the thoracic spine, the upper back. Of, um, and I was thinking, well, I, I didn't know that exactly what I was doing in those days about ME, but I knew that the center of the sympathetic nervous system in the spine was the thoracic spine. And the sympathetic nervous system was part of the autonomic nervous system. And... It was the area that helped you with stress and uh, it was always called the fear, fight and flight system of the body, but it was there to help all the organs, the blood vessels work better um, by control of the sympathetic nerves. So the sympathetic nervous system, I felt was a, a major factor in the field of ME because I felt that the symptoms of ME were all symptoms of sympathetic nerve dysfunction blood flow wasn't effect was affected um temperature was affected um the organs were all affected in different ways and the sympathetic nerves spread out throughout the body and i felt it's definitely got to be something to do with the sympathetics because i treated this person's upper thoracic spine and it helped his symptoms so it led me on a, a voyage, a voyage of discovery, uh, a long, long <laughs> voyage of discovery. And I started work at Salford University doing my early research. And when I approached them for an idea of what I thought was going on, what I was saying, my thesis which then started as a master's and then went, developed into a PhD thesis. I was there 11 years at the University of Salford. And in 2005, I published my PhD in the field of ME. I was one of the first people in the world 
to have a doctorate in the field of MA, and uh, which I was very proud of. But the, the crazy thing is that the doctorate was on the involvement of the neurolymphatic drainage and the autom- and the sympathetic nervous system in the in in the development of ME. So why was that crazy? Is because I hypothesized that what was going on was there was a drainage system problem of the brain and the spinal cord. And the as as my research took on uh, further depths, I realized that it wasn't just the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetics. And, and we now include the, the, the vagus, the parasympathetics. So it wasn't just a, fa- a fact that the automatic functions of the body were being affected, but that there was toxic buildup in the brain and the spinal cord. And this wasn't draining away as it should have done into the lymphatic system. And I was awarded my doctorate, my PhD by Salford University in 2005 in in ME, which in 2005 still wasn't believed to be a real illness by most doctors. In the field of drainage of the brain into lymphatics, which was definitely scientifically poo-pooed by most of the medical and scientific world including our dear friends in the ME Association. Charles Shepard have, and I have met many times, and he always says the same things. Raymond, I don't, I don't, we're not enemies, but I just don't like your science. I don't, I don't, uh, <laughs> I don't uh, agree with your science. And he wasn't alone. In fact, the whole medical world said in, those, in the t- times of 2005 that there was no drainage of the brain into lymphatics. So I was saying that the drainage of the brain in lymphatics was working wrongly. In fact, reversing was working the wrong way. And this led to ME and other diseases as well. So how did I know that there was a drainage system of the brain and that the rest of medicine was who said there wasn't? How did I know they were wrong and I was right? Well, it was for me, it was obvious, but... Why did the rest of medicine say there was no drainage system of the brain into lymphatics? First, we have to understand the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system is a system of drainage around the body. We have a system of drainage, and that's the blood. The venous return is one of the jobs of the blood is to drain away poisons. So why do we need a lymphatic system? I ask this question at most of my lectures on lymphatics to the medical world, and I get blank looks from most of the doctors who may have had one lecture on the lymphatics. And they say, well, we need them, but why? And they, they come up with all different solutions that, yeah, we need them for the immune system because the blood can't cope, but why can't it cope? And there's one major word I always look for, size size of molecule small molecules can go through the blood the blood capillaries if this is a wall of a blood capillary it's like a mesh filter small molecules can go through the 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 gaps in the wall large molecules can't get in so we need another system and that's where the lymphatics come in their capillaries their small vessels have walls that, like gills of a fish, opening and closing, allowing huge molecules to enter. So once they enter, they go through the lymphatic system, which is a system around the body, and it drains eventually into the subclavian veins, the venous angles, which are around here underneath the collarbone. So then they go into the liver and detoxify. And on the way, they stop at lymph nodes, de- uh, breaking them down. And they're full of immune cells, T cells, B cells that everybody knows about now because of COVID. But these are the lymphatic lymphocytes. And they allow the body to break down larger molecules into smaller molecules, eventually into the blood and then eventually detoxified in the liver. But the brain 
officially doesn't have a lymphatic system. In all the books of, of the past, you won't find anything saying about lymphatic system of the brain and the central nervous system, which includes the spinal cord, because there's a barrier stopping any large molecules entering the brain, the blood-brain barrier. You may remember well the big um, controversy over MMR vaccine affecting the blood-brain barrier, and Andrew Wakefield said it was causing autism. He was probably right, but he didn't have the research to back it up, and he sort of uh, cooked the books, as it were, and got into a big a lot of trouble. But the blood-brain barrier is a major barrier stopping any large molecules entering. And some toxins can get through, but it can be due to damage of the blood-brain barrier. But if we don't have a blood, uh, a large molecule buildup in the brain, we don't need the lymphatic system. So medicine has, for since the 1960s when electron microscopy proved the existence of the blood-brain barrier it was proved positive to the theories that there was this barrier and it shut the door on any ideas of a lymphatic system of the brain because we don't need one and i come along in the in 1989 in the early 90s with my crazy out of the universe theories that there is a drainage system of the brain and this was going wrong causing me so you can imagine the consternation and in, in, in different uh, circles and the um the uh, i mean i had doctors and and specialists walking out of my lectures in the early days around the world and uh, they were totally against it because it didn't make any sense yet university of salford allowed me to do research into it and gave me a doctorate in 2005, be long before the drainage of the brain was proven to exist. So good for them. I mean, <laughs> it was it was mad, really, if you think about it, and in a disease like ME as well. But luckily, my theories have been proven to be correct. Because in 2012, they developed new techniques for looking at the brain. And luckily for me, that I wasn't alone in my theories. There were other scientists around the world that said there was also a drainage system of the brain, and they were trying to prove it as well. And one of the main diseases that they felt was, a, was, causing, uh, was caused by a drainage problem was Alzheimer's. So the research into the, uh, the early research into uh, um, into the drainage of the brain was looking at beta amyloid, large molecules of beta amyloid that are linked to Alzheimer's disease. And it's not no strange coincidence that the early symptoms of Alzheimer's are very similar to a lot of ME patient symptoms. So what's going on and where is the drainage of the brain and how did i know that there must be a drainage system and i thought back to my days of physiology when i studied osteopathy in the british school of osteopathy we were taught about hormonal control by the hypothalamus in the brain the hypothalamus is a small organ that controls the endocrine system controls the hormonal system and how does it control it it controls it by a mechanism that the whole world of physiology and medicine accepts, and that's biofeedback. So let's talk about a bit about biofeedback. Let's talk about one very common hormone, insulin. Insulin is a very large molecule, okay? Small molecules um, uh, like water. Water is 18 Daltons large, named after John Dalton of Manchester. So when I, I do a lecture, I always wave the Manchester flag and said, John Dalton, there's a John Dalton Street in Manchester named after our famous son of Manchester, Professor John Dalton. And the name of mole molecular size is named after him. So 18 Daltons is the size of a water molecule very small and it can get through the blood brain barrier 
which is a barrier of cells with tight junctions. And they're called tight junctions. Even the med the scientific term for it is not, is not uh, it's called actually tight junction. And these tight junctions stop any large molecules getting through into the brain. But water can get through. But a large molecule like insulin, there is no way possibly it can get through the blood-brain barrier. It's 5,808 Daltons. It's a huge whopping polypeptide molecule. So how can that get through into the brain? But we know it does because the hypothalamus has, has insulin receptors on it that measures the insulin. So the insulin is produced by the pancreas in the tummy, goes into the bloodstream, insulin goes into the brain and the hypothalamus measures the insulin and therefore and then it sends messages back via autonomic nervous system back to the pancreas to produce more or less insulin and that controls the insulin levels and it controls the sugar levels and that is what we call biofeedback and that's how hormones all over the body are controlled by the hypothalamus and therefore huge molecules like hormones enter the brain how and now we know that our seven what we call circumventricular organs in the brain two of them are in the hypothalamus and there's the other there's the pituitary gland there's the pineal gland that controls melatonin levels in sleep and there's other areas which control subfornical and some commissional areas in the brain that control um, electrolytes, salts and sugars go in there. And there's um, these areas, area postrema in the, in the brain stem, which is very involved in, in autonomic control of the vagus nerve. That's another area where there's large molecules can get into the brain. And therefore, there's not much of a blood-brain barrier there allowing large toxins to get in. And if toxins get into the brain, they need a drainage system to drain them away. And large toxins need the lymphatic system. And therefore, all the way through my work, I knew there must be a lymphatic system in the brain. And we've thought about where it was, and it must be... Uh, other scientists have come up with ideas about spaces around the blood vessels called perivascular spaces. The trouble is that we could never prove this. When I was doing my thesis, we could never prove that perivascular spaces drain the lymph lymphatic system, drain cerebrospinal fluid, fluid from the brain into lymphatics, because there was no scanning technique to show the spaces right next to blood vessels draining off fluid it would look like one big black blob or one big white blob in, on scans that we had in those days we had no way of differentiating the fluid cerebrospinal fluid from the blood in such small areas in brain scans but in 2012 rochester university in new york broke that problem and they managed to use a new technique called dual photon emission tomography to show the drainage of the brain. And they showed it in mice, and they showed that there was a drainage system going through this very area into the lymphatics. However, this was not, not proven to occur in, in humans yet. This was 2012, seven years after my thesis was published. We had to wait a bit longer. But I said that one of the problems was the autonomic nervous system, especially sympathetic nerves. And if the sympathetic nervous system was involved in ME, it was because of a backflow of lymph. Because the sympathetic nervous system controls the lymphatic system. Most of the lymph vessels have smooth muscle walls controlled by sympathetic nerves. And therefore, if there's a buildup of toxins in the hypothalamus, which monitors and controls the sympathetic nervous system as well as the hormonal system then there's going to be a disturbance of lymphatic vessels instead of pumping out of the brain if this drainage exists it will pump back into the brain and this will cause further toxic buildup which causes further symptoms further disturbance of the lymphatic system which causes further 
buildup of poisons. So this was my uh, hypothesis, and I said it must be an area of the brain, and I'm going to show you on the slide. So I'm I'm allowed to share my slides. Yeah, can I uh, just share? Uh, the only thing to be careful of is make sure that you're showing the right screen of the slides rather than anything private you might have on your computer right. at the ET to, <laughs> no, to get that right. right. Okay, so um, we'll just get uh, 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 just trying to find I've got my workshop here just get down to the slide we want to show and uh, it should be here right, okay So, yeah. Right. So, slide. All right. So, if I share, how do I share slides on here? So, should be. So there should be like a green button that's got share screen. Share screen. Ah, we've got it. All right. Wonderful. Yeah, we've got it. All right. You should be able to see that now, yeah? Is yes, perfect. Screen? Right, okay, I'm going to put it into a slideshow just for this few slides. Okay, so this is the hypothalamus in this area here in the brain. And next to it, I've written, this is from, from my thesis. So I, I produced this, this uh, picture in 2004. And I said it must involve the locus luteus, which is a, a little spot in the brainstem, but actually is slightly blue in this in this picture, it's green. It was my Van Gogh period, so I just I, I changed the colours. But it should be a blue spot. It's actually blue if you do dissections of the brain. There's a very slight bluish hue in this area, and it's locus cerulius, meaning blue spot. And it's blue because it produces a chemical called noradrenaline. In America, they call it norepinephrine. And noradrenaline is one of the main neurochemicals used by sympathetic nerves. And I said that in my thesis, I said it must be related to the drainage of the brain because the hypothalamus controls the sympathetic nervous system and it's this system that's going dysfunctional, affecting the drainage of the brain. And Rochester University uh, scientists in 2012 looked at this and looked at what was going wrong. And in 2013, they discovered that the drainage problem that was occurring in if it did occur um would have been during delta wave sleep because this is when the hypothalamus and locus crudius shuts down and it allows the drainage of the brain to occur in the mice they were studying and this is why delta wave sleep is also known as restorative sleep because it drains the toxins away and that was discovered only in 2013, supporting what I was saying in 2004. Then in 2015, uh, they discovered true lymphatic vessels lining the brain in mice. So the fluid that was going through the perivascular spaces went into lymphatic vessels. And it took two more years till 2017 until it was proven in humans so this picture helped forge my my research work and help validate all the things i was doing for years because this was a three-dimensional on the on the web if you want to go on the web and this was the drainage system of a human brain into the lymphatic system. So it was a lymphatic drainage of the brain proven to exist, coined by the Rochester University people as the glymphatic system. And I was saying that this system is, is affected by either trauma to the head, trauma to the spine, postural problems affecting this drainage from birth even, could be hereditary, affecting this drainage that started the ball rolling in the wrong direction. And it could be a minor trauma. And the trouble is that there's, there were this 
when I said this, there was no proof of this drainage system existing, but now we know it does, and it goes right down the spine. Further on to this is actually going right further to a new system that has just been discovered this year, and this is a membrane which divides the space of the subarachnoid, which is on the, the membranes of the brain, so this is the, the membranes, also known as the meninges. When they get infected, you get meningitis. And this is the dura, and then you've got the, 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 the dura. This is the bone of the, uh, the skull. Then you've got the dura. And then you've got the arachnoid and the subarachnoid space and the pia, all part of the meninges. And then you've got the brain itself. Now, what my hypothesis was that was there was toxins draining out from the brain and if we could treat it and help stimulate the drainage to to affect the drainage of the brain then the backflow of drainage which would have occurred because of backflow of lymphatics and this would cause a problem we could then reverse that by stimulating the fluid drainage of the brain. So the drainage of the brain occurs through cerebrospinal fluid. And if we go back to this picture here, cerebrospinal fluid is produced by blood and it goes back to blood. And this was always believed to be the drainage of, of the brain. Cerebrospinal fluid drained around the brain and around the spine going back to the blood. But now we have a different picture. We know that is a drainage system into lymphatics. And the subarachnoid space provides healthy fluid to, to replace, replenish the drainage of toxins coming out through cerebrospinal fluid into the lymphatics. And the main lymphatic drainage is through the olfactory pathway. And this is through what's known as the cribriform plate. And the cribriform plate is around um, the, the, in the human, is around the, the, the above the no nasal passages. And this drains off toxins through the, the, the perforations in the cribriform plate of the, this ethmoid bone, which is above the na nose. And it drains through these perivascular spaces into the lymphatics. But there's also around the eyes, the optic nerves, the trigeminal nerves in the mouth, and the auditory nerves where there's this drainage pathway. Now, this drainage pathway is throughout all the cranial nerves, and there's 12 of them, and down the spine. But these are the main drainage pathways. So what I was saying that in ME, there's, back, there's a backflow of this lymph into the brain so the poisons go the wrong way and what's happening is when we stimulate the drainage going in the the subarachnoid space is meant to drain um meant to uh, replenish the drained toxins that go out of the lymph by healthy cerebrospinal fluid in the subarachnoid space but now we know differently. This year, only this year, this slim has been discovered and been reported on. And it's a membrane, sometimes only one cell thick, that lines that is in the center of the subarachnoid space. So the outside of the space is involved in the drainage system and inside the, inside the space is healthy cerebrospinal fluid. So the lymphatics, the lymphatic system, the lymphatic system of the brain drains into the subarachnoid space, and this space goes right down the spine, right down to the bottom uh, of the spine, to the sacrum. And so any damage, any poisons building up, any inflammation will affect the slim. And any any trauma to the spine or the head could affect the slim. Any infections that hit the body could affect the slim. It's got 
uh, uh, it's got um, uh, immune cells on it that can that uh, that can get um, overworking because if you've got infections in your body, any viruses, any in, in bacterial infections could affect the slim, and this could damage the slim as well as trauma. And now we know even more worse that if you have a lumbar puncture, I've got a picture of it here, if there's a lumbar puncture, it will puncture into the slim. And most doctors until now, well, all doctors until this year, didn't know it existed. So anybody who had lumbar puncture afterwards could have had terrible problems and sometimes they do lumbar puncture to see what's going on with ME patients. It makes them 10 times worse a lot of them because of this damage of the slim. And then women who've had epidurals, sometimes the needle's gone too far in and damaged the slim as well. But nobody's known its existence because in, in post-mortem it doesn't show, it just dissolves. So nobody knew it existed till this year with the new scanning techniques. So now we're, we're, I, I presented a paper at the International Conference on ME in Stony Brook University uh, this year on the slim and ME, showing that many people have damaged slim that will affect the drainage system. And this is why a lot of my patients need treatment for life, because as we drain off the toxins with my techniques, new toxins are continuing going in through the spaces in the slim that have been damaged, sometimes permanently, and sometimes by major trauma, major problems in the spine or the cranium. And it could be from birth even. So this is, um, unfortunately, we, we have this, and now the drainage system I have developed drains off toxins from the head down to the lymphatics. We use lymphatic drainage up, creating a pressure in this area, what I call a concertina effect. And the concertina effect drains off the toxins and using cranial techniques, it drains the poisons away. And if the poisons aren't, there's going to be a buildup in these perivascular spaces. And this is showing in the, is shown in this radiological um, um, examination of one of our, of our patients. And, it, and the doctor himself has reported on the large Virco Robin space, which is the name given to the uh, perivascular spaces, named after doctors Robin, Virco and Robin. So the Virco Robin perivascular spaces shows on this patient with ME. But what about long COVID, which I wrote a paper on? And I said that the same thing is going to happen with long COVID. And the first radiological evidence was presented in British Medical Journal. And this is a long COVID patient where there was prominent perivascular spaces in the brain of this ME, uh, this long COVID patient. So we know the brain drainage is not working well. We know there's evidence to support this now. And this is why I am um, stop sharing now, go back to me. And this is why I wrote a paper on long COVID on March the 11th, 2020, which is a day that the World Health Organization announced the pan worldwide pandemic. I remember that day well because it was my anniversary. And most people don't spend all their anniversary night writing a paper. My wife has finally forgiven me, I think. And uh, um, But this paper we, we eventually called Into the Looking Glass, post-COVID-19, post-viral syndrome, because we knew from SARS-1, remember COVID-19 was originally called SARS-2, and we knew from SARS-1, which occurred in Hong Kong and then was transferred to, um, to Toronto, and a few hundred people died of this. There was 20% death rate of SARS-1, which was very worrying when SARS-2 came along. We thought that it would be the same at the beginning. Luckily, it was much less, less than 1% death rate, but... SARS-1 had a 20% death rate. You can imagine if a fifth of the population of people who had COVID died. Um, so we knew 
at that time that the pathway from post-mortem on SARS-1 drain the, the toxins, the cytokines, and the, which we're going to talk about very shortly, and the actual virus went through this cribriform plate, went into the olfactory pathway, back into, into the brain. So there was this backflow in, in these SARS patients that led to a lot of people getting ME. So after SARS-1, a lot of people developed ME. And we followed the pathway and saw that the, the, the drain, that the toxins were going into the brain, the virus itself, and passing through the blood-brain barrier into the brain, through the olfactory pathway. And then it was draining into the hypothalamus, causing fever. So what was the first symptoms of COVID-19? Loss of smell and fever. So we predicted this was why it was happening. It was affecting the brain. And in our paper, we said the same is going to happen with SARS-2, with COVID-19, and it's been now shown to happen in SARS-2 as well, with post-mortem results showing exactly that, that the virus and cytokines, which are inflammatory toxins that feature heavily in my thesis on ME, which I wrote which I published as head in 2005, I talked all about cytokines. So what are cytokines? Cytokines are huge molecules of protein that attach to a virus, attach to a bacteria or anything, including cancer cells, anything that's bad for your body, the cytokines will attach to, and they're signaling molecules. They signal to those interleukins, interferons, and they signal to the antibodies to attack the invading um, organism or invading bacteria, virus, or if there's any cancer cells. So that's why in chemotherapy, interleukins, interferons are used in chemotherapy often as a way of targeting the cancer, signaling to the antibodies to attack the cancer. But in viruses, it, the cytokines are produced. We don't need to... Uh, uh, send uh, do chemo for uh, we have our own uh, chemotherapy within the body and the cytokines are produced now if you have a massive viral load there'll be huge cytokine production and they need to be drained away because if the cytokines are not drained away and don't after they 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 help get rid of the virus then they're going to attach to healthy cells and these healthy cells then get attacked by antibodies, and that's what causes autoimmunity. And we see a lot of autoimmunity in long COVID, and we see a lot of autoimmunity in ME. So there's lots of uh, people have problems with uh, different tissues and different inflammation, and there's build-up inflammation. And the research now by Jared Younger in Alabama, by, by Stanford University, have showed high levels of cytokines in the brain of ME patients, and we're seeing the same in long COVID patients. So I wrote this paper in 2020, in March, on uh, which was published in June that year, and it's now been cited by over 250 journals around the world. And the book, I'm writing a book at the moment, and we're calling the book through the looking glass, not just into the looking glass. It's going to be called Through the Looking Glass, the parent technique for ME. Hopefully be out next year. Um, and this basically shows how we can help reverse the drain, uh, reverse the problem, reverse the symptoms by getting the drainage system working better. So by stimulating the cranium, by stimulating the fluid in the brain, we can stimulate the drainage of the brain and by working on the lymphatic system around the body, we can help reduce the drainage of the rest of the body into the subclavian veins and into the right way rather than the reverse. Once the toxins have drained enough to help the sympathetic nervous system, the hypothalamus work better, then we have a system, a system that works and health is restored. However, now we know the existence of the slim we know that in a lot of patients, it's not possible to reverse 
completely. And we still need to continue on drainage for the rest of the patient's life. And I've got patients who've been coming to me for 25 years. I had one patient gave me an anniversary card. When we celebrated our 25th anniversary, she gave me a silver anniversary card. Her husband was sitting next to her. When she was in her 50s, I said to her, we'll, we'll grow old together. And she's now in her 80s and we are growing old together. And um, so we keep her going. And she comes every month and I keep her going. And she's been active, healthy, and even during parts of time when she's been unhealthy. This same patient had breast cancer. We got her through that. She had treatment for that. And then she came out the other side and we carried on treating. Obviously, she had mastectomy, which didn't help. But we carried on the drainage and it kept her going. There's quite a few patients who have mastectomies who uh, with ME. Afterwards, they develop ME. There's patients who have a lot of problems uh, after having ME, after having breast implants put in because it affects their drainage system. But the reason why women get ME and women get long COVID more is because of hormonal system. The hypothalamus controls hormones and hormones are much more a feature in, in women than men. Um, every month there's changes going on and then there's menopausal, per perimenopausal, a lot of perimenopausal. Women get ME. And uh, again, it's puberty can trigger ME as well. So again, it's much more from the female aspect and also the breast tissue. When there's a backflow into the breast tissue, that's the first port of call. And besides the treatment, I've discovered with my work, diagnostic signs. And there's five diagnostic signs of ME. One of them is spinal problems that all patients with ME have and long COVID they have upper thoracic spinal problems and they have also varicose lymphatics the lymphatics if they're pushed uh, they're not draining out they'll drain back up into the head and drain down and the first port of call will be the breast tissue breast tissue again is much more enhanced in female patients obviously and that that's another reason why women get me and long covid more and we can fill varicose lymph we can only see them in some patients, but they can fulfill them. And they're very large vessels that are colorless because of lymph, the fluid in the lymphatics is colorless rather than varicose veins, which are bluish or purplish because they've got deoxygenated blood in them. Lymph doesn't have blood in it, it has a colorless fluid called lymph. And this colorless fluid, the, the the vessels can go so big where you can actually see them sometimes but you can fill them just beneath the surface now they should be one a half a millimeter thick in health these subcutaneous um lymphatic vessels half a millimeter thick and most of the ones we're feeling in patients with me and long covid are half a centimeter thick they're 10 times the size. This is a buildup of this poisons building up and there's a backflow continuing to push against the valves of the lymph, damaging the valves, swelling them up. And then there's, when you feel around the, the lymphatics, I noticed every patient I was feeling, there was a point in the left side above the nipple line, just on the left side, we felt a tender point. Every single patient had this tender point, some worse than others. The worse the symptoms, usually the worse the point. And this became known as Perrin's point, and it's now in medical books and some books and in papers. It's been researched by other people. And Perrin's point is an actual point that we can see exists. And it exists because of the nerves from the thoracic duct firing off into the surface the sympathetic nerves, when they come to the surface, fire off to sensory nerves. So the whole left side of the chest becomes more sensitized because the thoracic duct, the main duct of the lymph, goes more left-sided. There's also loads of patients with ME get, most people get orthostatic intolerance. When they get up, their blood pressure changes, they get dizzy, they get palpitations, they get tachycardia, they get problems with the heart. It's not the heart, it's the blood, it's the nerves supplying the heart, the sympathetic nerves. And when they get irritated, and again, they stimulate the sensory nerves and the surface to be irritated as well. 
So the two networks of sensory nerves where they cross over causes this extra tenderness point. Sometimes it's uh, a patient might just have a flinch. You look at the eyes and you watch and they flinch a bit. Sometimes they go, ow, I had one patient actually hit me once. That was definite Perrin's point. Anyway, so that, that tenderness is there for all patients with ME and most of the long COVID patients we're seeing, especially in the conference we had in New York, everybody agreed that ME and long COVID were basically the same disease. It just takes time for long COVID to be called ME. So initially, after three months, they'll be called long COVID patients. After a few years of having it, they'll be called ME patients. So it's a, the same thing. It's the post viral. Exactly what I said. It doesn't just affect the lungs, COVID. In fact, it affects the brain much more than the lungs. And this is the problem. It's going into the brain and causing a problem. And it's only patients who have a dysfunctional drainage system will get long COVID. The only people who get ME will get will have it because their drainage system of the brain and spine doesn't work beforehand. So the virus is the final trigger. And it's the cytokine buildup afterwards which causes the buildup of inflammation that doesn't drain away because they need the lymphatic system of the brain to drain away. So it's people who have this backflow to begin with that develop ME develop long COVID, develop fibromyalgia as well. And in fibromyalgia, it affects certain areas of the brain that are very much involved in the pain regulation. That's the basal ganglia and the thalamus in the brain. And this has been proven to be a, a occur in, in, in fibromyalgia. So there's a toxic drainage problem that we stimulate by using cranial techniques, cranial osteopathy, that is the drainage of the brain itself. And then we do lymphatic drainage techniques. So that's what gets you better. But the physical signs are the spinal problems, the lymphatic varicosities, the Perrin's point, and there's also a tender point in the abdomen, the celiac plexus in the solar plexus area. That gets affected because the sympathetic nerves are affected as well. And the final sign is the cranial rhythm, the rhythm of the brain, which is the lymphatic system. Cerebrospinal fluid is produced by blood, as I've told you, and it goes back to blood. But some of it drains to lymphatics now, we know. And the cerebrospinal fluid in the brain moves at 50 to 100 beats a minute. When it drains to the lymphatics, the thoracic duct has a beat of around four beats a minute. When you have two waves coming together, a very fast wave and a very shallow, slow wave, physics dictates what happens next. You get an interference wave. And this interference wave, osteopaths call the cranial rhythm. You don't need to be a physicist to understand that. You just have to be into a beach. You go to the beach, you see a big wave coming in, small wave going out, crash together, produce a third wave. It's the same thing in the body. The drainage of the brain drains to the lymphatics, causing a third wave, and we can feel it as, as osteopaths. And this is called the cranial rhythm or the cranial rhythmic impulse. And that's why cranial osteopathy helps, but you need the lymphatic drainage as well. And together, combination of lymphatic drainage and cranial is the Perrin technique. And that's how we get people well. Some are lucky that they haven't got too much damage of slim, so they get completely better. Some need treatments for the rest of their lives, but we keep them in a much better level and quality of life improves. But we're not miracle workers, and sometimes it's just too much damage. So whatever we do doesn't help. But we try. And most of our patients around the world are being helped. Um, and uh, this is uh, what we do. I mean, and we have a scale when we when the patient comes in to begin with, we, we have a score system to work out. And that's based on the history, based on the symptoms, based on the physical signs. And uh, we have a zero to 10 scale. I always tell patients when they come in, they're not zero because they wouldn't be here if they were. And 10 is perfectly healthy. So they're somewhere between and important. So we've just mentioned uh, in the recording uh, before it was recorded, but we mentioned about the, the, um, the Stockport ME group survey showed that the parent technique was the most popular technique and helped most of the, the patients the most. 
but there was a ME survey of 2010. And in my clinic, I always give the advice I'm going to give to all of you now. And the advice I give to the patients when they first start, we don't start treatment ever the first time. And my practitioners are taught never to start treatment. Golden rule, we start treatment the next time. It's a consultation going through and diagnosis and prognosis and a game plan. But the one advice I always give to patients is as follows. I call it the jigsaw puzzle analogy. Now, we've all built jigsaw puzzles one time or another in our lives, made jigsaw puzzles. And if you're an expert jigsaw puzzle, I'm not an expert, but I, I do like a nice challenging jigsaw puzzle. You start with the corners, okay? And then you do the edge pieces, and then you do the sea and the sky in the middle. You That's the way to build to make a jigsaw puzzle the, the quickest way. You can do it any other way, but that's making it much more difficult for you. So we'll start with the corners, the edge pieces, and then the center. So what are the corners of ME? What are the corners of long COVID? What are the corners of fibromyalgia? And this is these are the corners. Number one, rest. Have a period during the day you have complete rest very important not to push 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 all the way through so have some rest if you are resting anyway if you're sitting up watching television or whatever talking lie down for some time during the day have a complete rest away from sound away from light away from everything have periods of rest during the day and in when you're resting don't just rest the second corner, relax. Don't just rest. And I say to my patients, don't just lie there and I'm resting. I'm resting. Dr. Perrin says I should rest. I'm resting. Yes, I've rested. That's good. Right. Now, what next? That's not resting. You have to rest your mind, relax, chillax. That's number two corner. Now, if you find, as most patients with ME do, because they're high achievers and they're pushers and they're frustrated, I mean, my name for ME is TPOS. That stands for Thoroughly Beep Off Syndrome. If you right, so um, <laughs> we don't say the beep. Uh, so that's my name for ME. Most patients are fed up, thoroughly fed up, and they don't want to rest, but they have to, and. The other thing, so sometimes they need more than just being told to relax. They need to learn techniques. And that's number three corner, meditation, mindfulness, breath works, any meditative thing that you can do that's going to be relaxing for the patient, do. So that's meditation. That's the third corner. And the fourth corner is the most important corner. And it's the corner I've been shouting about ever since I got involved in ME and shouting from the rooftops against the medical profession, against NICE for years and years and years. Pace, pacing. Once I gave a lecture on pacing in the in a conference, and I talked about pacing, and then one of the doctors came over to me and he went, oh, do you mean pacing up and down the corridor? I said, no. Pacing means half of what you feel capable of doing. And this is the golden rule. It's the fourth and most important corner of the jigsaw puzzle. Everything you do, you should think, can I do double what I'm doing? And that should be okay. So you always do half of what you feel capable of doing. And then those are the corners. The edge pieces is the parent technique itself. And then the middle parts are all the talk therapies you might do go into, or, or, or supplements or drugs that you might need. All that is the middle part. But the, the outside is rest, relaxation, meditation, pacing, and the parent technique. Now, going back to the, going back to the survey of 2010, what did patients vote at the, in the ME Association survey? Number one. Pacing, that was number one advice. Number two, relaxation and meditation. And number three, the parent technique. 
And because it was those three, the graded exercise and, and uh, CBT, which were part of NICE guidance, were near the bottom of the 25 listed. And this was a big embarrassment for the ME Association. They didn't want the parent technique to be anywhere near the top. So they just ignored it. And, and the only thing they used it for was to say that pacing, that, that cognitive behavioral therapy in GET doesn't work. But uh, I challenged uh, Charles Shepard and the ME Association, but they said, well, well, the numbers weren't big enough. <laughs> I can't win, can't win. It was the largest survey ever done in the ME world in this country, and it showed this. I tried to get NICE to look at it again in the recent gui guidance, but they refused to acknowledge it. So patient power is what we need. And uh, eventually with research we're doing now, we're doing research into long COVID, uh, that's gonna be published uh, next year, but it's finishing the end of this year. And that's on self-management because we teach self-massage and self-management. And the NHS love that because it's free. <laughs> We've done it at home. And my book has, has that in. Uh, there's a book on, on uh, for patients, which is this book here, The Parent Technique. And if you're, if you're really into the science and want to know everything about it, is the big book, the second edition. Some of you might have my old book, the first edition, which was published quite a few years ago. But in 2021, we bought these two books out. And then next year, there's going to be a book on long COVID. Um, so that's going to be out uh, in the new year. So um, we just have the, through the looking glass. Well, that's going to be, yeah. This is going to be this one here through the looking glass, um, but uh, we're not. This is a, a this is a, a trial uh, front cover for it, so it's going to be called through the looking glass. It's going to be out in Hammersmith Press hopefully next year, uh, as long as I finish it. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, I always say about deadlines. Um, um, I, uh, Douglas Adams of the famous Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy always said, I love deadlines, I, I love watching them whoosh by. <laughs> um, so hopefully I'll, I'll finish in time. So that's my quick uh, talk on my work. So uh, oh. any, qu uh, <laughs> any questions? Firstly, thank you very much for, for coming to us, uh, Raymond. It's very much appreciated. Um, what I'd like to do with questions is allow one or two questions that our people are happy to have um, shared as recording, because sometimes it could be something that the question might be really useful for everyone, and then stop the recording for, for further questions. So um, if people want to speak, they can just speak, or they can raise their hand using the reactions icon, so we know there's yeah. a, um, thanks a good for, question. Yeah, thanks for a good talk. I just wanted to mention about myself. Some time ago, I did do, was a participant in the research study at Risington, oh. where they diagnosed whether, without asking oh. the symptoms of what you, you saw, yeah. whether yeah. they think they could diagnose from physical examination. And yeah. I'm pretty sure they'd have got me correct as a ME patient. I mean... We had 86% successful with that. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, what's always occurred to me is, with the plastic spray, I can't really see with the clothing, but I've got the lump here. Yeah. At the top. And yeah. then it goes flat. And it, yeah. my thoracic spine always feels dead stiff, yeah. whereas I don't have pain in my lower back, but I also have pain right at the top of your neck here, and I'm always self-massaging here because this gets painful in the dips here. Yeah. Yeah. And also, on my shins, to so the size of my shin bone, it always feels like there's discomfort locked, so to speak, really deep under the muscle and under the flesh. So I kind of wondered... What relevance to your remit you thought that was, really? What, with the pain in the upper neck? Yeah, well, any of it, all, all three of those things, really. Well, the flatness in the spine is what we see in virtually every patient with ME. That's what I teach. The curvature okay. in the spine. So when you, when when your your spine develops, it should develop in a, in a, yeah. in a curvature. I'm sure um, it used to be curved, yeah. Um, but as um, if, if you were very active as a youngster... I don't know if you were, um, as a teenager. It depends. The spine, yeah. phases, it depended, different phases of when I was and wasn't. Yeah, you know. but the thing is that the spine often develops wrongly and it causes a, 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 flat, a flatness in the, in the spine due to postural problems and due, due to developmental 
problems and it can be because of overuse so a lot of very active people develop me later on in life mm. because of this but that's the flatness of the spine and so are you able and to reverse that flatness to get it into no, the no but no we're not um but what we can do is help it move better so the flatness causes a restriction of drainage in the in the spine. Uh -huh. And by working on the spine, we get it moving better. Sometimes it changes the posture a bit in younger patients. But basically, it will actually, what we do is we open up the spine and get the spine moving better. And that helps the drainage of the spine itself. So the flatness causes a restriction of the drainage. Right. Now, the pains in different parts of the body are all related to sympathetic nerves. So the pain you're getting down in the in the in the shins might be they might look at the lower lumbar spine and think, well, your lower lumbar spine, which has nerves coming out from affecting the lower legs, look fine, but they're not looking at the right part of the spine. Mm -hmm. Sympathetic nerves fire off to sensory nerves around the body and can cause weird and wonderful symptoms anywhere in the body that don't have an explanation when you go to a neurologist or a doctor they won't understand it because they're not thinking of sympathetic induced pain but this is what's happening sympathetic nerves stimulate painful reception in other parts of the body by by irritating sensory nerves and that's what that makes, that makes a lot of sense it really so, does so if you look at the, the the sympathetic nerves in your in your thoracic spine and your upper lumbar spine that's where the problem will be lying you get yeah. that moving it will help the pain down the legs as well yeah okay do we have any other questions before we turn the recording off and have questions off? Uh, hi, hello, Monica. I have a question. Um, I've not got my camera on, but it's Monica. Monica, speaking. Monica, yeah. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Hi, Raymond. Thank you for that talk. It was really interesting. Um, I have a question pertaining to long COVID. So I'm a long COVID patient, and yeah. my main symptom is chronic fatigue syndrome slash ME. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to... <laughs> I have two questions. The first one is theoretical. I've been reading a bit about how uh, the theories about how long COVID might be related to micro clotting in the blood yeah. and how there's like little things stuck and that means oxygen isn't flowing quite how um, it should do. Yeah. I was just, as you were talking, I was just feeling like these two things might be super connected about things not draining and yeah. things also being stuck in the blood. Yeah. So we've got yeah. two problems that are quite interconnected. Yeah. I wanted to get your thoughts on that. And the second thing was practical. How do we go about booking with you? Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's the second yeah. question. <laughs> Thank you. It's always, a, it's always a big problem uh, trying to get in. We have other practitioners around the, around the country and we have practitioners around the Stockport area as well. But uh, for people who want to see me, they, they can phone my, my clinic, um, to, uh, Stockport ME, I have my details, but um, it's we're on the website. The Parent Technique uh, website uh, has all the different practitioners around um, and uh, all the licensed practitioners who I've trained tre uh, and continue to train. We have uh, CPD, Continuing Professional Development, we have uh, work, uh, workshops and we have uh, conferences every year to make sure that the practitioners are up to scratch. Um, and uh, But if you want to come to see me or my team in Prestwich, I'm in Prestwich, Manchester, so not too far. We have quite a few patients coming from all over the world and as well as Manchester. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you are very welcome to phone up uh, our, our practice, which is um, the number is... Um, on the web but i'll give it you now quickly it's 0161 773 0123 it's easy one to remember i knew for patients and they need an easy number to remember so it's 773 0123 and um then uh, we, we can see I, I often see patients first and then refer them on to closer practitioners mm -hmm. uh but we have a, a team of uh, practitioners here in our clinic in prestwich um I am in Man I am in London. Uh, I do have a, a, cl a working clinic in London once a month in the London area anyway. So um, for people down south can see me. And then I, I travel. Um, we don't I don't do many house calls anymore. It's very hard for me to get there, but I do occasionally do house mm -hmm. calls. And as I said, travel around the world to, to train up other practitioners. So if you know patients isolated in the UK, 
where there's no practitioner doing the parent technique, I'm willing to come and train up practitioners in that area. Mm. Or we have training courses in, in Manchester every so often as well. Um, so that's how you can get the, the, the treatment. Now, as far as the, the blood clots are concerned, mm. yes. Well, the whole metabolism is affected with ME. And that's because the autonomic nervous system and the hypothalamus regulate the auto, regulate metabolism, including the formation of blood vessels and blood flow and blood 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 cells. So uh, it's very important to know that if there's stagnation and there's backflow and there's disturbance of the autonomics, it can affect the the not just the size and the and the, and the um, the uh, health of the blood vessel, but also the blood cells. Now, in ME, we knew about sticky blood a long time ago. Most of the older members of the ME Association will know Andy Wright, who was a doctor who I worked with for many years and who was a very great supporter of my work. And he, unfortunately, was... was um, struck off the register of medicine for a while because he was treating ME and Lyme disease. And Lyme is, is very close to ME because it's Borrelia going into the brain causing neuroborreliosis and not draining away. So it's the same thing. But Andy's work was stopped because of doctors being jealous, doctors fighting him. And he had to, had to back away, unfortunately, from ME and... He was a great asset to the ME community. And he showed in his live blood analysis, sticky blood in, in ME patients, that there was big clumps of, of clot, clotting blood and there was big clumps of, uh, of red blood cells that clotted together. And this was known in ME for years. Now it's been shown to happen in, in long COVID. Um, so covid is the same as I said, the same things that are happening. It's not in every patient, and va vaccines have been shown to cause clotting, and that's something to do with toxins affecting the, the blood uh, the blood, blood blood cells. So that's an extra added problem with patients who have vaccines that can cause blood clots that can actually aggravate the, the problem. Um, I'm not against vaccines, but I'm against the abuse of vaccines and if patients need a vaccine, then it's something desperately needed, and it's that what's helped get the world back. So I'm um very I was very pro vaccines. However, now I'm not sure how much the vaccines are are needed to a point where um that that some patients must must be very careful about the vaccines because the vaccines contain adjuvants and contain sometimes uh, preservatives that can uh, and chemicals that can affect their ME. So it's a choice that you have to make and it's each patient's individual. Um, I know for a fact that certain patients have responded very well to vaccines and I know for a fact patients have responded very badly so i'm always asked about the vaccine question and i'm on the sh uh, on the on the defense i'm afraid mm -hmm. um it's all the battle of each individual <coughs> um and um but i do know that certain patients um definitely responded badly to the vaccines and we knew this before we started with with covid vaccines was one of the triggers that led to ME in many cases because of the heavy metals in some of the vaccines. Um, uh, in the early days, there was thimerosal in vaccines, which was um, a preservative that contained mercury. So they were injecting mercury into patients with uh, years ago, uh, for uh, and that can, could trigger the ME with heavy metal toxins building up in the brain. Then they changed that, and then a lot of the vaccines early, uh, later developed, uh, had aluminium oxide, which was an adjuvant, which stimulated the vaccine to work more. And this, again, caused, caused a lot of problems for patients with, uh, with, uh, with ME. Um, so we had a big question when I asked about the vaccine to, of, uh, for ME, for, for ME patients, 
was the, the COVID vaccine um, something we should advise patients to take? And basically, it's um, if patients have a lot of problems with allergies like mast cell activation syndrome or hypersensitivity to lots of chemicals, then you've got to be very careful. Um, but um, as I said, it's a, it's a big question. Uh, so some patients have, have avoided vaccines and some patients have managed and some patients have had them and have made, made worse. But we knew this was going to happen. So that's, and that can trigger blood clots as well, as you know. Um, so the clotting is, is something that we've known for ME for years and years and years, and it's just been obviously found in, in, in COVID now. Okay. Can, can the parent technique help with the microclots, Raymond? Like, um, can it that's, uh, well, no, uh, there's no evidence to say it can, but if it gets the body working better, then the body should be able to help. Um, the health of the body should be better to uh, allow the body to not build up any further clots mm -hmm. and uh, the blood flow should work better, but there's no absolute evidence that that's occurring.